Hey guys, welcome back. Today, we're gonna to be talking about five big mistakes that new trainers often make, how to spot them, and how to potentially avoid them if you're new on your journey in horsemanship. So these don't necessarily only apply to new trainers. They could apply to people who've been doing this 20 years, 40 years. It doesn't really matter where you're at, but I know that I made these mistakes early on. So that's why I'm bringing them up as something that new trainers often do. We often go through these phases, okay? I do want to preface this video by saying I'm not coming at all from a judgmental or self-righteous way in saying this. I'm not one of those channels that openly criticizes other trainers to get clicks or views or make myself look better. In fact, I try very hard in my life, instead of covering up the mistakes I've made and pushing that shame to the side and pretending it never happened, I want to be very realistic about the things I've gone through and let it create empathy in me toward other people who may be going through the same things now, okay? So if I can tell you this is what not to do, maybe it can help someone along their journey. Let's get into it. All right, so number one is blaming the horse, okay? This is a big one for me. It really rubs me wrong when I see this. And I know I've been guilty of it at times in the past when I've had some really difficult horses. And looking back, I can say, you know, a lot of those issues probably were created by me or at least weren't fixed by me as time went on. You know what I'm saying? Like I didn't do anything to help that horse get better or get through those issues that it was dealing with because I didn't have the knowledge or capacity to do that. But a lot of times when we're going through that, we can't, um, as new trainers, we don't want to accept that maybe the problem really is us. You know, our scope of things is actually really narrow when we start out. Even if we're trying as hard as we can be to be open-minded, it's hard to know just how much you don't know. And so I would say blaming the horse is one of those big things for me that just, just avoid it. Just when you feel the temptation to blame the horse for this or say he's stupid or he's a pea brain thing, or, you know, I see this a lot in the Mustang competitions. People will go through this and be like, well, he just wasn't a hundred day horse. And he had this issue and that issue. It's like, no, actually uh, a better trainer could have got a lot more done with that horse. And I know that sounds blunt and it sounds harsh and it sounds mean. And there really are horses out there that do have limited physical and mental capabilities. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of times when people blame the horse, it has much more to do with their shortcomings than the horse itself. Even if you think, hey, this is a horse's fault, I would say try to be very careful to take a little bit of an introspective look at yourself and just realize in the future you're going to look back and be like, you know what, maybe there's a few things I could have done differently. And I say that because, again, I've made those same mistakes and I look back all the time and think, you know what, what if I use this exercise on that horse? And it can be a decade ago, it can be 15 years ago, and still sometimes I look back and I wonder those things because there probably was something I could have done differently and it probably wasn't the horse's fault. Number two is taking things personally. I can't believe how many people will still do this no matter how far along they get in their horsemanship journey. They still have this belief that the horse has a vendetta against them or something or that the horse is purposely misbehaving and doing things wrong. And I do know there are some horses that have kind of gotten away with things over and over again and they're 100% convinced that they're gonna get away with it again with you. Um, but one trainer brought this up to me in a certain way that's really affected my perspective on it and helped me to stay very much more patient with my horses and help guide them through their processes. And this is what he said. He said, the horse is always trying to give you the right answer, whether it's something that he's done in the past several times that worked for him and now he's just continuing to try to give you the answer because he's 100% convinced it's gonna work or you're not being clear enough with your intentions and your request with him, you're not giving him the right information to give you the right answer. So he's giving you what he can for the information he's provided, okay? So a horse is always trying to give us the right answer. It's the right answer in his head. It might not be the right answer you want him to give, but to him, it is the right answer. So try not to take things personally with your horses and horses don't ever have a personal vendetta against us. All right, number three. And I think this is one that we're all guilty of. I don't even know if you can avoid this in the horsemanship process um, and will your gaining experience, but that is jumping to advanced maneuvers without mastering the basics. And sometimes I wonder, like I said before, this is, you, you don't know what you don't know. So you're doing your best and often we think, oh yeah, I've mastered the basics. I've got a shoulder yield, I've got a hip yield, I've got this, I've got that. But then I wonder at times if it takes working on the advanced maneuvers to realize just how much we left out at the foundation. And I think the best way to counter this or to do this right is to work underneath another trainer who can really help you be thorough with those basics. But if you're on your own, like I was, then it was something I went and go, tr would go try to do lead changes when I hardly had a grasp on how the shoulder had to work and how to keep that out of the way and keeping the rib cage soft and keeping the horse on an arc. 
So as much as I say, work on your basics, master your basics, master the foundation, I also understand that sometimes this can be really difficult to do if you already think you are there. So if you watch your advanced horsemen and a lot of the people you look up to and you watch them train, you'll notice just how long they spin on really small, really slow steps. We see them do these big 30 foot stops and they spin 100 miles an hour and they do the lead changes flawlessly and we think that's what they're working on on a regular basis. But what they're actually doing behind the scenes is so much slower and so much more meticulous than all the big maneuvers we see in the Chopin. So keep that in mind. Try to avoid that if you can, but I also know sometimes it's just part of the process. All right, number four, applying heavy pressure without feeler timing, which causes a lot more brace and anxiety. So I've been guilty with this one a lot in my past. And you often don't realize what you're doing until someone calls you out for it or until you see yourself on video and you have time to reflect. Because I think so many of us want the best for our horses. We have the very best intentions. We know all about, we hear the feeling timing, be soft on your horses, slow with your hands, slow with your feet. We hear all that stuff and it can be easy to think we're doing that until we actually see ourselves in motion and realize just how fast our actions really are. So one time this really came to light for me and kind of hit home as I was about 18 and I was, had been working on this horse's stop and it just really wasn't coming together. This horse kind of would dribble into the stop and it pushed on my hands a lot. And I'm a big believer and I always have been in not reefing on my horse's face. I really don't like to go to the face at all, but I would kick on my horses pretty hard. And I was just working so hard as day after day trying to get this horse to stop better. And finally, one of my trainers was watching me and he came up to me and said, hey, what's happening here is that you're putting that horse in such a bind so fast when you go to the stop that he can't move. He's stuck right here and you have his chin to his chest and his legs all bound up and then you start kicking on him. And the only thing that he can do is to make this big tight move and kind of jump out of it. And his legs are so bound up, he can't make the move you're asking him to. And I realized just how fast I was moving my hands how tight I was, what kind of a bind I was putting that horse in and then trying to make him hustle through it faster whenever he couldn't even make the move. So it's very important that you slow your hands and feet down. Give that horse time to respond, give him time to make the move. The softer you go, the less brace and anxiety those horses will have about the maneuver. Once you start to realize that and once you can pick up on that, you're gonna see just how much more relaxed your horses become through maneuvers. And the big thing for me, and I harp on this all the time, is relaxation. So mental relaxation, physical relaxation in my horses. A horse that's not relaxed can't learn. If you slow your hands down, slow your feet down, don't apply so much harsh, heavy pressure suddenly, uh, that's gonna help you a lot. All right, number five, the mistake of not reaching out to more established trainers for advice. Sometimes we feel like we have something to prove so we can't reach out to other people or they might think we're stupid for the questions that we ask, so on and so forth but that is the opposite of what's gonna happen. So established trainers are your most valuable resource for information you can get because every old horseman, he always says, you know what? Even if I had another lifetime, I couldn't learn all there is to learn about horses. So you have this invaluable resource of all these trainers who've gathered knowledge over the years and shared it with each other. And yet we start out here and we start trying to reinvent the wheel instead of going to these people for advice as soon as possible. So I would say, reach out to more established trainers, do internships, train with them, spend several years with them, do whatever you have to do because you're gonna get light years ahead of just then if you just try to figure a lot of this stuff out on your own. And maybe you don't have the means to go ride with somebody for long term, but you can still call them up and get advice from them. And on that same note, I'm gonna bring this up too, is be careful how you ask because I think we've kind of lost the art of asking for things well. And I, from personal experience, I've had a lot of people just message me out of the blue and say, how do you fix this problem? Can you tell me how to do this? Can you tell me how to do that? And well, I don't think that's bad, there's a high chance I'm never gonna to respond to those messages because they never showed me that they valued my time in any way, shape or form. So I think it's important if you do reach out to these trainers to at least show that you respect their time um, to say, hey, could I pay you for a consultation call? Could I pay you to come take a lesson from you? or I really value your perspective on this. I really like how you do this. If you have a minute, I would love to talk to you about X, Y, Z. Just really show them that you respect and value their opinion and that you're willing to pay for it. So every time I've reached out to someone in the past, whether it's for advice on um, my video stuff or photography or horse training, anything that I'm looking for advice from a more experienced mentor, then I make sure to let them know I'm very willing to pay for their services because if I wasn't, you know, I, I value them. I value it monetarily. 
And if I didn't, why would I be asking for their advice? So I think if you're asking for someone's advice, you should be ready and willing to pay for it. And most of the time they will never charge you, but it does show that you respect them and you value their time and you know that it's worth something. And I think people just appreciate that. So I'm not saying that from a cocky sense or like, oh yeah, no, I'm too good for that. Um, I won't get back to you if you don't offer to pay me. But I think the respect should be there. And, and it also shows that you understand they're running a business. They're very busy people. They've got a lot of appointments. They've got a lot of things going on. And so for me, that's, that's a big one is when someone just reaches out to me out of the blue and how do you fix this and this and this and this? Like, well, buddy, I've got a business to run. I can't sit here and spend an hour typing out this email, trying to help you fix your problems when I've got a million other things that I need to do that'll actually make me money. I enjoy helping people out when I can, but I think it, we all feel good when we're appreciated and we know that that person knows that our time is worth something. So keep that in mind, reach out to those trainers, get advice when and where you can, but also value their time and know how to make an inquiry and a request. Be very respectful of people's time. All right guys, so that is it. I have a part two coming as well, but those are the five most common mistakes that I see a lot of new trainers make. Let me know in the comments below what mistakes you made in the past or what advice you would give to new trainers. Maybe let me know what advice you would give to me because I always love hearing people's bits of advice. Um, I think it can be very helpful and insightful and I know that in another 20 years, hopefully, hopefully I look back and say, you know what, I've grown. I made this and this and this mistake. Maybe I can make a dozen more of these videos <laughs> as the years go on. Uh, I hope, <laughs> hope I'm not that bad. I hope I'm not currently making that many mistakes, but you never know. I also hope that I'm growing over the next 20 years. All right, so let me know your best advice. I can't wait to hear it. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.